Hello, hello. How are you? Apparently good. <laughs> so we're here tonight to talk about um, the politician. <laughs> and America's obsession with Ben Platt. We're here to talk about that. Um, it was one of the most fun things that, that I've ever made. Um, largely because I got to work with some old friends and some new friends. And how about this cast? They are so phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, so right before the curtain went up, Ben and I were talking, and I'll continue that conversation. He said, um, he thinks that I'm a witch. So, Ben, please, please talk about that. I think it's funny. What a way to begin. Um, <laughs> I just find, and I don't want to give anything away for our upcoming season, but I find that Ryan and also Brad and Ian again and again uh, seem to predict things that are going to be important in the news and in the world and put them in the show long before they are. So that, to not spoil anything in season two, has happened yet again. So um, you are a witch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, he's talking specifically about a couple of media calls today wanting me to discuss the, uh, the idea of thruples which, again, not to spoil anything, and also we had, we had, I think, landed on something really weird and interesting with the, um, the college cheating scandal that, that also is miraculously in the news. So those are the reasons why he says this about me. So, and just like your general demeanor and, you know. <laughs> I wear capes. <laughs> um, so, Ben, let's start with you. So, my story about this show is very specific in that I went uh, to see um, Dear Evan Hansen on Broadway. <laughs> <clears throat> but also Miss Dreyfus was in, of course. <laughs> and I had the experience that I think anybody has who sees Ben um, in that show specifically which was like, wow, I've never seen anybody like Ben Platt. So I asked for a meeting, and I got a meeting, and <laughs> I had had, basically it was just for me to fawn over him, and, and I've told him this before, but I, and I really think that Ben is in that male Barbara Streisand category where he really can do it all, and he's like a once in a generation <laughs> talent. So I just wanted to talk to him about his sort of preternatural gift and we were talking and I said, if you want to, I really would like to do something for you. And what do you want to do? And what did you say in that meeting? Do you remember? I mean, I didn't have to say that much because what you presented was sort of exactly what I was hoping for in the sense that I think you really, once again in your witch-like abilities, <laughs> sensed that I was really looking to take some kind of a left turn and do something that would allow me to stretch in a different way and uh, use <clears throat> you know, the tools that I love to use and the things that make me an, an individual, but also in a completely different lens and in a character that's far more confident and almost sociopathic and egomaniacal and assertive and really takes up space because you had just seen me play someone who was so, you know, deteriorating and tiny and anxious mm -hmm. and small. Um, and other than that, I just heard, like, I think once you presented the actual show to me and told me that, like, Gwyneth was going to be my mother, and like that we were going to, that I was going to be like the titular politician. I just sort of everything else just kind of like went numb, and I didn't really hear much else. But it sounded great to me. <laughs> yeah, it's an idea that Brad and Ian and I had been talking about, I think, for three years, and I had always put it aside because I thought it was going to be so impossible to cast that part until I saw Ben. And I think it's a weird part because it's really. You love him, and yet he's unlikable. And you need a very specific actor to be able to, to make you empathize and root for him while doing these kind of off-center things. So Ben, for me, was that person, and we wrote it. And when we were done, um, we talked to Gwyneth, and she's married to one of the writers, so she had to do it, which was good. <laughs> um, but we're old friends. And then Jessica Lang. <laughs> Another national treasure. So Jessica and I have obviously had a very long um, and fantastic working relationship. And 
one of the reasons that I've loved working with Jessica, and I hope that she's loved working with me, is because um, <laughs> what I like to say to actors that I love, and I've loved Jessica for a long time, is, you know, quite simply, what do you want to do? What do you want to do that you've never done? And from that conversation has come um, so much American Horror Story and Feud and Long Day's Journey Into Night, for which she won a Tony. So this conversation was a little different in that I called her up. She's elusive as always, but she knows whenever the phone rings and it's me that I really want something. <laughs> so I said, I have this part and um, I really, really want to see you do a comedy. And I remember Jessica, you said, me in a comedy, a comedy? And I had to remind her that she won one of her two Oscars for Tootsie, which is a comedy. <laughs> But I wanted to see her sort of go back to that world and that realm because I think she's so good at it. And Jessica, could you talk a little bit about that idea? About was it, was it interesting, intimidating, fun? I, I just remember us laughing a lot when we shot it. <laughs> well, I, you know, if, if you had played this character, kind of character that I am in this piece, in a drama, it would have been, I mean, it would have been heart-wrenching and tor tormenting and difficult and all those things. But somehow that it was in the context of comedy, you could, you know, take those same, those same elements and somehow turn them so that it wasn't as black as it seems. Um, and it, it was it was very interesting for me to I mean I I did remember I had done one other comedy in the last forty years, <laughs> <laughs> but um, this one was so dark. I mean th it was very different from the comedy that I'd done you know all those many years ago. Tootsie. It, this one was really dark. My character is very very. Uh, monstrous and <laughs> and I kind of I, I mean that's what appealed to me about it that it it had an edge to it and I didn't have to play it for comedy it was just there because I don't really I don't know anything about comedy so it was it was very interesting and you know Ryan is one of the most when he wants to be <laughs> one of the most seductive people you will ever meet. And I always know when the phone rings and I hear, hello, lady. <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> I said, I'm sitting on the front porch at the cabin. He says, what are you doing? I said, nothing, absolutely nothing. <laughs> and then he starts spinning the tale of what this character and this piece is going to be. And he always knows, like, very specific kind of key phrases. Like monologue. Like. <laughs> <laughs> that one gets she loves me, a good monologue. Gets me every time. <laughs> 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 but also, you know, she's West Virginia, so I know, great, that's going to be an accent. That's going to be, like, real specific to, and um, I think he used the word mullet. <laughs> So I thought, well, that'll work. Well, that's somebody, Warren Beatty, when I was just starting out, I, I had the joy of talking to Warren Beatty, and I said, can you just give me one very succinct piece of career advice? And he paused, and then he said, it's all about the wigs. <laughs> and I never forgot that. So in the case of Jessica's character in this show, as I recall, I may be wrong, but once we came up with that look, which was a tribute to Karen Black, you know, in Five Easy Pieces, I remember you saying like, okay, well this is insane, but I got it, yeah. right? Can you yeah. talk about that process, about the look of the character for you? Well, I mean, the idea of Karen Black, who's always, and in that role in Five Easy Pieces was one of the great screen performances ever. I mean, it's so indelible, her performance in a wonderful film. Um, but the look was specific, and I knew if, you know, when we talked about that look, Karen Black, it occurred to me that, okay, well now we've got West Virginia, we've got this look, and, and you know, I kind of spun a bit of, um, you know, 
history that this would have been a young girl growing up in some small rural enclave in West Virginia, poor, and her idea, the, like, the pinnacle of glamour would have been Karen Black in Five Easy Pieces. Mm -hmm. And she adopted that look probably when she was a teenager and she never let it go. <laughs> and uh, you know, she still wore it fairly well. <laughs> a little worse the wear, but yeah. But it was great because, I mean, as outrageous as it was, I've always completely 100% trusted Ryan with the idea of what it was going to look like, what it was going to sound like. Um, from the very first time we worked together in the first season of, of American Horror Story, when he put me in that 60s beehive, I don't know who we were modeling that on, but it was, yeah, I always know with Ryan that he, as he's formulating the character, he's also seeing very specifically what that character looks like, how she deports herself, what you know what information she has about the way she looks so um yeah i just now you know i just trust him even though sometimes i have to you know i'm in a parking lot in the you know the valley in la like you know standing around waiting to shoot and i'm thinking to myself here i am in like leopard skin capri pants and, <laughs> and a mullet and like Fake, la fake nails with jewels hanging off them, and you know, <laughs> but it is a leap of faith. It is. Well, one of the, one of the things I love most about, uh, and I love so much about this show, is I love the scenes with you and Zoe because uh, so much of that stuff um, is ad libbed, which I've never had that experience with you, obviously, because the stuff that we've done for the most part has been dramatic. But I just, from the very first take of you guys in a in in a Olive Garden booth. <laughs> a lot of those scenes are just Jessica and, and Zoe just going crazy and like coming up with funny stuff and they were riffing like jazz musicians. It was a wonder to watch. And was, did you love that process? Yes, very much. I loved working with Zoe. She's a great young actress. And um, yeah, there was an immediate rapport that we had and connection, a, a real emotional connection. And she found me funny, which was like, <laughs> it was, <laughs> I was just blown away by that. I thought, in fact, she said to me, you're one of the fun, you are the funniest person I've ever, and I thought, this girl's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> but it was great working with her. Yeah. So Lucy, um, who <laughs> is, you know, one of the sweetest people you will ever meet. I find it, I find it interesting when people talk to me, or, and I wonder if your experience is the same, where they think of Astrid as sort of a villainous character, or uh, there's a, and I never thought she was that. I, oh, I know, what, did, what, was, what is your response to that? And how do you feel about that? And what, what was it like playing her? How was that different from other things that you've done? Yeah, I do feel very defensive of her when people say that because I think it's very easy to box someone um, who carries themselves with coldness as just one thing, that they must be the villain of it or, yeah, villainous in some way. But I think she was such immediately such an interesting character because she is kind of a contradiction in herself and she's been handed this formula of her life by her parents, predominantly by her father, and told to be told what to strive for and what to be satisfied with. And you see her in one sense following that in a kind of very military way because her father says so and there's a very interesting dynamic there. But also at the same time kind of unraveling that and starting especially across this first season to realize that that isn't at all what she conforms to internally. And so I think her coldness was always, it was always a form of protection. And as soon as you meet her parents, I think it becomes so understandable. Mm -hmm. As soon as you see the environment that she is supposed to succeed in in some way or be authentic in in some way, you do understand this need to have a barrier. And I think increasingly we feel that way as well um, in society now with this debate on authenticity, with the increase of social media and a kind of another self. 
Um, so I always found, yeah, found that investigation of her very interesting and, yeah, always very defensive of that cold side of her. Mm -hmm. And we start shooting season two in a week, which is very exciting. So, so Lucy, what, what is your hope for Miss Astrid in season two? Like, what would you, tell me what you'd like to see and I'll tell you whether you'll get it or not. <laughs> okay. Um, Jessica's I still on death row, she reminded me backstage. <laughs> <laughs> um, I kind of, I'm excited to see her fight back a bit more. And okay, that's happening. Check, great. Um, what else? Um, I don't know, I kind of, yeah, I want, I want authentic Astrid to kind of rise to the front rather than this like other self that she has used to protect herself. I kind of, I want to see that slowly shredding and shedding away. I love bits of season one Astrid and I want that to come through as well, and, I, and of course she'll maintain that coldness, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think the kind of messiness of grappling with who she really is and how she really is. Well, one of my favorite things in the show is in the last episode, and I, and I feel this in my own life, where um, all of the young people show back up in support of Ben. And this idea now in our culture of just really wanting something, someone to believe in mm -hmm. is such a powerful idea. And what I loved about the writing of it and the shooting of it is that by that time, I mean, of all the casts that I've ever had, and I've had many, this cast is so insanely close. And so I just wanted Ben and Lucy and anybody else who wants to chime in, talk about your Disney obsession and how you, they're <laughs> always at Disneyland or, so talk about how you guys all became so close because you can feel it, you can see it on screen and we're riding to that in season two. So Ben, you're, you were the, the, this was kind of your doing, I think. A little bit. I mean, you crazily made me an executive producer on the show when you uh, brought this to my attention, which is an amazing thing. And I think there are many ways in which you know, because it's you and Brad and Ian, there, there's, there's not a lot of things that you really need me for. You know what you're doing. You're very smart guys, and creatively, <laughs> um, the formula is proven. And I wanted to make myself as useful as I could. And also, coming from the theater with me and Laura, just coming off of Dear Evan Hansen, we made a very special bond with our family there. And so much of what made that experience worth having, and also made the show, I think, um, sort of extra powerful and special is, is that we could really feel that connection. And for me, that any time I do a project of any medium, that's what I love the most. And so I was very keen on making sure that we all got to become close and feel like one piece of one community, especially because it's a show with a lot of disparate storylines and we're not really shooting all together very often. And so creating as many opportunities once we were all cast to uh, get to know each other and spend time at like a beach house for a weekend or go to Disneyland f twice or... Um, <laughs> You know, that's that's the part that I'll sort of take with me in life. Not that this hasn't also been creatively and artistically beautiful, but like the fact that we get to pick up human beings and like add them to our lives is what has made it very, very special. Yeah, I and the thing that I will add to that is, you know, and I'll tell Ben why I made him an executive producer, because <laughs> I believe I believe that um, I love like I talked about this earlier, but I really believe and love actors. And I wanted to empower Ben to sort of get to have his voice. You know, most actors are given a script and then you perform it and, and you feel sometimes unempowered. And I wanted to empower you and I wanted you to feel like your voice mattered and your voice was heard. And I will tell you in the casting process, every person on the stage got cast because of Ben. Ben had hugely passionate opinions about the process and who he thought would be great in these roles. So if you love the cast, it's because of Ben, because he was really an advocate. Which leads me to this idea that so many people in this cast, this was kind of a new thing for them, um, being in front of a camera. So Ronnie, for you, you had a whole different career kind of going on. Can you talk about that? And then can you talk about getting the call for this part? Um, so, um, right out of college, I worked for Homeland Security. Um, <laughs> <laughs> basically the same thing. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I did that for about four and a half years. I worked for the Office of Inspector General, um, which is the oversight body for the whole entire department. Um, and so we did a lot of stuff with counterterrorism, aviation security, you know, boring stuff. Um, <laughs> and it was rewarding work, but I was like, I cannot do this 
for the rest of my life. I couldn't possibly. Um, so I quit. And uh, it was hard to walk away from those benefits. Um, <laughs> but I knew that I needed to do it for my mental health, essentially. Um, and so I took a year off trying to figure out what I was going to do if I made a horrible mistake. And then um, I moved to New York, started working at a hat shop. Did that for about <laughs> three years, and then I dis discovered community theater and fell in love with performing. I've always studied it. Um, uh, just like actors on screen and on stage are just being like, I wanna, I wanna do that, but I'm just so nervous and so afraid. But then I was just like, you know what? I don't wanna you know, get older and have these regrets of not at least trying. So I did, um, got a manager. And uh, you, you were you sang a lot like uh, Darren. You sang with Darren Chris, no? Mm -mm. Okay. Oh no, no. You know that story? Okay. I don't. I used to. I okay. thought you did. So I go to this musical theater piano bar, Marie's Crisis, and I would always see. Woo! Hey, Marie's. Um, and I used to see him all of the time, and he would call me Lids, and then I would because of the hat, and <laughs> <laughs> and he would be there performing with his wife. Um, but I would sing along, not necessarily like, here's a duet performance. She's a beautiful singer. <laughs> Stop it. But Ronnie, by the way, has an insane voice that she didn't tell us about until like four months in. Wow. And, and it was not even her, it was her fiance played us a video at my house of her singing and I truly had a conniption. I was like, how could you not <laughs> have told us? Sorry, keep going. <laughs> it's fine. And then I got the, okay, I got the call for the show and I was just like, wait, it's a Ryan Murphy? Sign me up. And then, yeah did the audition was terrified and it was it's just been a whirlwind ever since to be sitting up here with these amazing people is just like a dream come that's true that's such a great story <laughs> so, so speaking of auditions julia tell me about your audition because i feel like my memory of it is very different than your memory of it could you talk <laughs> have about have you heard me talk about it because <laughs> I'm, I'm interested in your take on it because as somebody who well. you know with ben helped hire you what, tell me what happened. What did you think? Um, something, you were, something else had happened right before it, correct? I was just very flustered by the whole process <laughs> because <laughs> I was so excited. And I, I, like I came in to test in front of Ryan, Ian, and Brad, and I grew up worshiping their shows. And because I'm old. <laughs> yeah. like high school, I wasn't like four. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> and um, and I came in, and so yeah, I just I just done a movie about the Manson family, and so I came in, and like somehow I started talking about it. I just remember like talking and talking about cults. <laughs> for and that's where you got the job. <laughs> yeah, Alice is weird. <laughs> um, um, so you thought you thought it had not well, gone well. Well, and then. So it was honestly all a blur. And then I did the scene. And then I remember I got up and started to leave because I was like, like you guys were just staring at me. And I was like, I <laughs> guess it's over. And so I get up to leave. And then one of you goes, isn't there a second scene? And I was like, oh, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> and then I like ran back and did this. And then I left and I was like, what <laughs> did you just do? You spaz. And then. Uh, <laughs> but it's a hard part because she's written very eccentrically, mm -hmm. right? Can you talk about that? Because yeah. also, you know, you guys are sort of like nothing like your parts in some weird way, mm -hmm. which is why it's always so fun to see you in person and then see the cuts because it's not the person I know, which I love. Mm. Uh, did you have trouble with how eccentric she was or no? Um, a little bit. I really wanted to make sure that she was grounded in something and she puts on this like mask and this voice and this face. Um, and when I first read the script, I don't know, it just something about, like something about that made sense to me where that was just, the tr that's who she was mm -hmm. to me. And I knew that this was a girl who was hiding a lot with a facade and wanted to be this perfect first lady so badly, but it was so important for me to always, for Alice, have her lead with love and her love for Peyton. And I needed that to ground her um, because she is eccentric and she's zany and like, you know, she dresses like a Nancy Reagan, and it's like, <laughs> you know, like she's this crazy 17-year-old. But at the end of the day, I needed to make sure that it was her love for Peyton that that was driving her, so that it was didn't get out of hand or wasn't uh, born out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the most fun things that that I have ever done. Uh, 
in my career. Jessica was traveling this weekend, but I had all of the cast come to my house and watch the whole thing. We bench watched it one afternoon, and then we had a dinner. And one of the great moments that I can recall, although we were all a little drunky at the time, was um, a little uh, <laughs> how Laura kept getting in our group and has, has since huge rounds of applause because how brilliantly her faculty for language is so, and how, how aptly she can speak at such a great clip as an actress and that you always know what she's saying and there's emotion there. And I, I wanna talk about that because it's almost like this insane gift that you have for language. Wow. Um. <laughs> I wasn't aware. <laughs> and, I, and I will tell you when we were writing it, like that was always sort of our, our idea that like what you showed up with in the audition room, you were the only person who could do it, the only person who ever read it without one drop of a comma. And I was just so blown away by it. Are you, are you aware that you have that or no? No. No, no, I think honestly, I think it's a testament to your writing and I think that I, I think the rhythm is so clearly on the page, and I think that this girl's incredibly cerebral, and so she doesn't have time to pause because her brain is a constant stream uh -huh. of thought, and that seemed very clear in this writing. And so, to me, the comedy is just her streamlining and not taking a breath, and so, yeah, that, I, I think that was more credit to you, but thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I also I love how your character dresses. I love her sense of style. You know, and Jessica and I have worked with our customer Lou for a really long time on many projects, and we love her. Obviously, she's insanely talented. Your look was sort of modeled in a weird way. I don't know if you know this, sort of as a, a postmodern Diane Keaton approach. And I'm wondering, did you, did you know that? Did you feel that when you would put on those suits? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no, I think like if I, I, there's like this meme where you can put um, like three characters in pictures that describe who you are, like your spirit. <clears throat> and I think it was like Rapunzel from Tangled <laughs> and Diane Keaton and, it, and something else I can't remember, but um, clearly didn't resonate. But Diane Keaton is like, her style, I just feel there's something so wonderfully casual about her chicness. And it's, I think what's interesting about this character is, yeah, she's incredibly cerebral and awkward, but she's so in her, in her, like comfortable with herself in a weird way. And I think her clothing really speaks to that because she just is very free and expresses herself that mm -hmm. way. So, Theo, one of the things that I'm so fascinated with and I, of, of all of the stories here on the stage, you know, yours is perhaps in many ways so moving to me. Can you talk about, um, you were in Chicago. Yes. I was and, and you were having trouble even getting auditions, correct? Can you talk about what that experience was, was like and then when you got the call to do this part? Yeah, um, so I grew up in a really, really tiny town in the middle of Illinois with, that had 5,000 people in it and there was one stoplight, and I was like, I want to be an actor. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I went to college, and then I moved to Chicago, because I was like, I can probably only afford to go here, and it's probably my best shot to at least get on stage. And I was like doing plays, and I miraculously got an agent right when I moved there, and I was sending in like self-tape after self-tape, self and I was kind of having some success doing theater, and it was really cool, but I was like, I want to be on TV, I want to do film, like that is my dream. And um, I was frequently having the issue with like, getting all these breakdowns for trans characters, and it was always like, we want somebody who's more masculine, or someone who is not as far as you in your transition. It was just like all of this like, like BS about like wanting a specific kind of body, and I was like, oh, I don't like that. Um, and then uh, this audition came, this breakdown happened, and um, I was like, wow, shit. Like, I, I just get to act. Like, that's, mm -hmm. that's really cool. And I was working at a coffee shop. Um, I was uh, kind of, I was like in between jobs, and I was like collecting unemployment, and like all of this stuff was going on, and I was not financially stable, and like everything was a mess. And then 
I thought that this audition was a total mess. And you I guess did? <laughs> I did. Oh my God. Actually that day, um, that day I had had three auditions. I had had a callback for this show called Chicago Med, if anybody knows what that show is. Um, <clears throat> and I like couldn't afford public transit, so I was just like biking all over the city to get to these tapes, and this was the last one that I had. And I kept screwing up all of the lines, and my agent was like, Theo, just breathe, you're gonna be fine, you're doing a great job. And then we finally got it, and then basically four days later I had an offer and then three days after that I was in Los Angeles and it happened so quickly. Um, yeah, uh, so quickly that it's been a year and I'm still kind of in disbelief that it happened. I'm like, wow, I'm here? This is so cool. Um, so yeah, it's like, you know, I think that when, you know, in the pilot when Peyton talks about like, he's known since he was you know, seven that he wanted to be president of the United States. It's like, that resonated with me because I was like, you know, I always wanted to be an actor and everything that I wanted has totally come true and you've made that possible for me, so thank you. That's great. So, so uh, Jessica, I wanted to ask you your, your opinion about this. So you, you have two Academy Awards, you have a Tony, you have, a, I, don't know, I don't know, God knows how many Emmys you have. Um, the entertainment business has changed so dramatically in the last two years with, with streaming. What's your take on it all? What's your, what's, your, what's your feeling about the evolution of it? Do you like binge watching? Do you binge watch? <laughs> um, what's, what, how do you feel about how quickly things are moving now in show business? Well, I, in a way, I lament the kind of films that we were all working on in like the 80s and even into the 90s. I mean, the 80s, the seven, the, I mean, my first film I did in 1976. So it was the end of like that kind of golden era of auteur filmmakers and the beginning of this really thrilling, thrilling filmmaking, I thought. Um, where the parts were great and they were the the films were well financed you didn't have to scrape together you know a hundred producers to make a film um, I remember that Sidney Pollack told me years ago I'd seen him and he said you know the the films that we really we really came to you know to love and to do and he said that's over now and so I think there was a time where it suddenly became huge blockbusters or tiny independent films. And that middle road of all the films that I made a career on, like Sweet Dreams or Tootsie or Francis or Blue Sky, Music Box, I mean, they just went away. They, they didn't really exist anymore, where you were working with great directors, great actors, you were paid a decent salary, and the film was, you know, released through a, a studio. And so that was, that was a difficult, I think, transition. Um, and then suddenly you had all these, you know, like the kind of box store movies, the, the big blockbusters and the, you know, the, the sequels and the pre-sequels and everything that one, I mean, it was like suddenly that was an area that I knew nothing about and had no interest in. And then, the, you know, you took chances on small independent films and maybe one out of 20 or one out of 50 ever made it into some kind of, um, you know, prestige um, position. So I think with the streaming, and although I don't watch TV, um, I know. Because you don't have one in your cabin in the woods with your turnips. Well, no, and what, what happens is, like, if I'm ever somewhere and, like, I want to, like, at a hotel or something, and they have, like, you can stream stuff, I get really confused. It's, it's, it's the same thing of, like, buying clothes. There are too many choices. So I like it when somebody gives me something to wear, you know, then I don't have to think about it. But with, 
I, I think what's great about it is people are beginning to work more and more and more, and everybody gets a chance to do something. And, uh, and it seems to be an endless audience. And, um, and really, I mean, I think television and streaming and all of that has really taken the place of the kind of films that I love doing in the so-called heyday of my career, you know? I mean, it was like, but now, the parts that I've done with Ryan over the last six things, uh, six, you know, uh, projects that we've done together have been some of the favorite of my entire career. I mean, I've loved doing every one of them, and I feel really lucky that I met Ryan and he gave me the opportunity to work this way. Because at a certain age, une femme d'un âge certain, there is, uh, everything just kind of evaporates. And because of Ryan, I've been able to continue through the last almost eight years doing parts that have been as interesting and exciting and yeah, I, I, you know, challenging as the parts that I did at, you know, in the early part of my career. And for that, I'm deeply, deeply grateful to him. He's... <laughs> once, once he likes you, and sometimes he doesn't like you, but some, <laughs> when he likes you, he's like one of your best champions you could ever find in your life. I'll take that. So, what about the rest of you guys? Have do you do you binge? What's the the la I I I love the experience of it, and I loved me and I love being at Netflix for that reason. You make it, you can watch it how you want to watch it, when you want to watch it. I feel molecularly, it's it's kind of how I want to consume content now. You know, I love it. The last two things I binged watched were Mindhunter season two, yes. which I loved because David Fincher's my favorite director. And I, I recently binged the first two seasons of Succession, which I also love. What about, what about Ben, what about you? Um, I just watched all of Los Spookies on HBO. It's really, really good, really cool, funny, weird, smart, and also Big Mouth on Netflix. Um, it's fantastic, and Bojack Horseman, which has just released a new season. Yes. Let's go down the line, Lucy. I'm a big fan of the OA. Love, uh. yeah, 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 I love that. Every response to every tweet about the politician is save the OA. I, <laughs> I love it, I see you. Um, I binged uh, Sex Education. It was hilarious. Um, and recently, like today, I started watching Scandal again. Um, just just playing, pulling that out of my hat there. Um, most recently, I binged Looking for Alaska. Yeah, and then um, because it's Halloween and spooky, I just watched every season of Scream. Yeah. It's on Netflix, people. Um, I guess, I mean, binged, I guess, Queer Eye, but yes. um, I love, like, like Hallmark Christmas movies. <laughs> And you do? I love, I love knowing what the story's gonna be before it happens, like, I love it. <laughs> like, S like this city girl walking in un inappropriately tall heels in the country, starts a new life, meets a small town contractor. So it's meditative. <laughs> it's incredible, and I love it, and I've been watching, and, and I have to say, on Netflix, there's a lot of those. Yeah. <laughs> and it like makes me Christmas very happy. <laughs> Um, I'm, yeah, I'm halfway through the latest season of BoJack Horseman right now. Um, it's so good. Yeah, it is so good. And I'm watching The Umbrella Academy. I'm pretty late to it, right? I love The Umbrella Academy. And I love the streaming service Shudder. I'm a big horror yes. person, so I'm always, like, going into Google and being like, what is the scariest movie on all streaming networks? And then I watch it, and then I have nightmares. <laughs> That's me. So before we get into our questions from the audience, you know, since we start shooting season two in a week, I, I thought I would let the cast, if you guys want to, ask me a question, since I always seem to be the one who's asking the question. So if you have any 
I won't do a lot of spoilers, but if you have any burning oh, things you want to know about season, about season two? two, about anything, my life, anything. my love, my loves, <laughs> Jessica, I'll tell any anything, anything, open book. Oh my God, this I is. Have, I have a question. I'm curious. You you tend to hire people who are very um, unique and interesting people, and also as actors. And I'm curious to know what it is that you that that attracts you to certain people that when you when you choose to work with them. That's a really great question. Um, it's, it's two things, really. It, the, the, I sort of divide my life in terms of, um, and if you look at all the, the things that I'm working on, I, I cast from a place of, of fandom, um, of like just loving people like Jessica and Ben and, and you. Like I just had seen your work and I had loved it and Lucy as well. Um, so from a place of, oh, there's something sparkly and fantastic about that person and I want to get closer to that person. So a lot of times it's just wanting my way of getting to hang out with people that I love. <laughs> um, but you know, Jessica had meant and continues to have mean so much to me. You know, I can't even tell you how, how much she has meant to me in my life. So to get the opportunity to call her up out of the blue and she picked up the phone and I got to pitch her. The first time a thing I pitched her was Constance in American Horror Story. And, I, and I, if nothing else, I, I thought, well, she's probably not gonna do this, but I will go to my grave getting to tell her how much she meant to me. I kind of felt that way about my, my, my meal with Ben. I just got to say, God bless you and you're amazing and I'm rooting for you, so it's that thing. The other thing is just, it's an, a thing that I don't understand, but um, I think I have a really good picker for, and all of you have it, um, if you move me, I think you will move the world. So when I'm watching something or I'm sitting in a room, it's just like a spidey sense. It's something that happens, you know? It's a feeling that I get from actors who I love that I feel will translate to something, and I believe when I cast, the more specific you are, the more universal you are. And, and, and I like that, and I like this period of my career where you know, I, can, I have that power, I have that freedom to cast who I want to, to shine that spotlight on people. As we discussed here, sometimes who are struggling, I'm like, I see you, I get you, because I felt like that too when I started out, you know, like Theo, I felt exactly like you did. I'm never gonna get a break, nobody's ever gonna see me, I'm not ever gonna get to do the thing that I love. So I see that sometimes in people and I'm like, oh, that's me. That's a, that's a very powerful thing to be able to advocate for, you know? Long answer, sorry. Um, any other questions? <laughs> I have a question. Go. Okay, there, it's two parts, but they're quick. Which character in the show do you feel is most like yourself as a human being? Peyton. Okay. <laughs> and not counting the pilot that you directed beautifully, what's your favorite episode of the show and why, of the first season? Um, that's hard. I, I wouldn't count the first episode. I think that I look at seven and eight as one big episode because we wrote it that way and then we just split it in half. I love so many things about those two episodes. I love Jessica's insane monologue, um, the if I did do it monologue, which she, that was all in one take, by the way. I think that was five pages of dialogue that Jessica Lang did in one take. And um, I love that, and I love the ending. I love the last episode, I love when the group gets back together, I love when you sing Vienna. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and let's talk about that too. So one of the things about this show that's so interesting is we had no intention of releasing the Politician soundtrack like we did last week. It really only happened because of so many people were writing us, please release these songs. Uh, so Ben, what did it feel like when it debuted like within the hour on iTunes, the number one slot, and I think stayed there for four days or something? Four days, yeah, number one. It was crazy. It was crazy. I mean, it was just like I'd never been in a position where like I was putting something out that people had already expressed 
a love for and a desire for. So it was like so much less scary than putting out like original music or putting out our show in the first place that no one had ever seen before. It just felt like a, g a gift going both ways because it's people who really wanted to listen to this music and um, I, you know, we get to share it. And it's also like happens to be Joni Mitchell, Billy Joel, Stephen Sondheim, you know, like all of these amazing people and wrapped into one and Zoe Deutsch and we get, everyone finally gets to hear that Zoe Deutsch can sing beautifully. Yeah. And um, it was, it was really exciting. I didn't expect it to be so, I mean, it also just made me excited for how many people are watching the show. It was just cool to see yeah. what an audience there is. Any other questions before we do the questions? Do it. Has there been anyone that you've worked with that intimidated you? Mm. <laughs> I, was I was intimidated before I called Jessica. I remember, pay I mean, she would never <laughs> say it. I, because, yeah, I mean, Jessica, because I had loved her, and she meant so much to me, and, um, but I will say, after that one phone call, I was like, okay, I got her. Okay. <laughs> and then, and then it I've just be- always been easy. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then for me, it was just about, like, okay, let's, like, she wants me to not be intimidated. She wants me to show up with my thing. So when I knocked in her trailer, I'm like, okay, let's talk about what you're wearing and your voice and your thing. Like, the intimidation factor was gone. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, yeah, that's a good question, though. Jessica. <laughs> All right, let's get to these fun questions. Um, this one is for me. Um, this is from uh, Drew. Uh, the question is, your music for all the time periods and all of your programming is always spot on. Thank you. From Poe's American Horror Story to The Politician, what is your process like for picking the music? Um, that's a really good question. You know, my right-hand lady in my company, her name is Alexis Martin Woodall, and, and she does all of my post. She's my editing right arm extraordinaire. And she has a really good ear for a lot of stuff. So in the case of Pose, the first season I was very involved, and now I'm like, will you show me something? or you come to me. When we were doing um, this season of The Politician, I would say a lot of it, the only thing that was scripted was River, uh, which is in the pilot. And a lot of people think that I just named that character River so that Ben could sing River. <laughs> a lot of people also think we wrote that song. Um, <laughs> we, have, we have to tell them who Joni Mitchell is, which is great. Um, I will say in this season, it was really kind of Ben. I remember Vienna, for example. I don't even remember what the other choices were, but I sent him an email saying, you're gonna do this, and you're gonna, this is what it is. Here's three songs that I love. What do you want? And he immediately replied in 10 seconds, as he always does. Um, the quickest texter on earth, <laughs> Ben Platt. That was his choice, and I was like, that's good. In the, in the case of the, um, the assassination episodes when we did the Sondheim stuff, like I've always had a thing for Sondheim and he's always been so kind to me. He always gives me the rights. So I, I, I selfishly, I will say that was my idea just because I wanted Ben to sing that song. Um, so it just comes from a place of passion and collaboration. I remember when we did American Horror Story, when I went to Jessica and told her, um, who loves, she loves to sing, by the way. She gets so excited about the songs and the monologues. <laughs> um, she, I remember you being kind of like, what the hell when I said I want you to sing David Bowie, but then you kind of got into it, right? Oh, well, yeah. I mean. <laughs> 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 but I, 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 I was gonna ask you, I never knew how you came up with Life on Mars. I mean, I know it's Elsa Mars, and I mean, there was that you know, connection in the title, but. It was just, yeah, it was so crazy. Well, how I came up with it is a very interesting quick answer, which answers this question, which is that when I was growing up, I felt like a freak. I felt like there was nobody like me. I was from a very religious, conservative upbringing. And I remember constantly saying to my grandmother, I feel like I'm living on another planet. So she would say this joke about, are you living on Mars again today? So when we were writing that episode, I put all of those things together and it came from a personal place, which is always, I think, the best. That's what I try and do, you know? I'm always just a fan too. I'm the biggest fangirl alive. <laughs> um, so I, I like to 
feature things that I personally have a connection to. Um, um, this is from Pippa and Eloise, huge fans age 12. Aww. Where are you guys? Stand up. Oh, there they are. Hi. Hey. This is for the cast. Um, what was your most memorable scene you guys filmed and why? Good question. Mm. Let's just go quickly. I loved, on my very, very first night, um, I mean, it wasn't a great scene to start with, but when you're sitting outside covered in blood and Rivers died. Um, <laughs> but it was the first, it was my first experience on this set and just acting with Ben for the first time. And it was really hard to kind of stay in that and be in that very, hectic scene and I remember when we would reset every time we had to reset I was down the other side of the path he was back on the stairs and we would just walk past each other and you would just knock my hand every time and we'd be heads down in our own places but you'd just touch in and I thought it was the most generous sign of just like see you but you do you it was so beautiful so that moment Aww. I never knew that <laughs> I got to yell at you a lot I know <laughs> So I guess that was kind of fun. Okay. <laughs> um, also, probably the dinner. The first it was my first one of my first days. It was the dinner table scene where we just spent like hours, like talking at each other from across this like <laughs> uh, however long table with like candelabras in the middle, like trying to see each other and like hear each other. And it was just like a beautiful first week of filming. Yeah. I think probably that library scene where we were like walking through the library together and it's like that really long thing about Ray the technician. And tagging the uh, infinity SUV in the background. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I just remember being so intimidated that day, but yeah, it was fun. I was super nervous doing the scene where um, James and Alice get caught and yeah, I, hi. Um, <laughs> And uh, the little scene that Ben and I do afterwards, for some reason that day, I was like, wow, this actor is like 100% open and just like giving me everything. And it was just, I was like, I went home that day and I was so grateful because I was like, oh, God, like this, it, it just was a cool day. And Janet Mock directed that episode. Was that the episode yes. Janet directed? Yes, Janet directed yeah. that episode. Yeah. Oh my God, Janet. That was, a, that was a great day. I remember that day. Um, Jessica, <laughs> what was your favorite scene? The shoot. <laughs> <laughs> you like the monologue. Come on, you like that. I like a good monologue. <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this, is a, um, this is a great question to our cast and to me. Um, this is from Paige. What is the most rewarding part of being a part of such a gender, sexuality, fluid show? Ah, it's the best. It's a great question. My answer to that, and, I, and I'm probably sure I have a different answer, like I, I, when I create something, I create a world that I want to live in, not necessarily a world that exists. And I believe, and I have always believed in the power of the medium, because I think that if you see it, you can be it. And I think that so many people can have their hearts and minds changed by what we do. So I'm always very conscious of, of the casting and what we're saying. So for me, it's just, it's part of my daily life now. It's like you eat breakfast, you go to the office, and this is the approach that you have. And it, it also came to me from a place of shame, interestingly enough, because um, I created a thing in my company, which is sort of in line with this, called the Half Foundation. And the rule of the Half Foundation is that half of all of the television episodes produced in my company have to be pr produced, directed by women. That's just how it has to be. And, you know, and I, I came to that rule in a very embarrassing thing happened because when I was doing the People versus OJ, I only had, I think, 16% of all the slots in my company were women. And yet, I was a minority, I was gay. When I directed my first episode of television in 1998, it was me and a bunch of straight white guys over 50 and Dockers who looked at me like I was, you know, an alien. So I was just so ashamed when I realized that, that I had not done 
more and walk the walk. So I had directed Sarah Paulson in episode six of that show, an episode called Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. And I thought it was a great episode, but I, when I was done with it, I was like, this should have been directed by a woman. And I called up my boss and I said, I'm changing how we're doing things here in my company. And she immediately said yes. So from that moment in 2016 to now, I think our average in my company is 65% of all the episodes in my company are directed by women. So for me, that's my answer. It's just, you know, it's a way of being. But what about for you, you guys? How do you feel about it? I think it is unbelievable. I mean, we say it all the time that representation matters because if you don't see it in the things that we view consistently, like how do we know that change is happening? Um, uh, personally, I, as a lover of TV and film, it's disheartening when you don't see someone that looks like you on screen and that is in, in, a lot of, in a lot of ways. Um, as a black gay woman who presents more masculine, um, I wasn't sure if Hollywood was ready for me or would ever be ready for me. And to uh, have a character that aesthetically I saw myself in was important. And not only in front of the camera, but being able to live in my truth um, in Hollywood off screen and I thought it was important, and I think that um, this show does a good job of just letting people be, and is amazing. I think it's helped me not be so scared anymore. I think I was like, oh, you know, what kind of battle, you know, like depending on what kind of, you know, marginalized position you come from, what, what is the uphill battle you're gonna have to fight forever, and now I'm like, like, I feel like things are really gonna change, um, and it feels like we're on the cusp of something like permanently changing and like not just being a wave and like not just being a, a phase. Um, and if Hollywood tries to say it's a phase to that, I say like, sorry, it's not. Like things are gonna be different now. And I really think that a lot of, you know, shows that, you know, that Ryan has created have, have made that possible. So, yeah. Thank you. I mean, and Ben, because you were so involved in the casting, what, what can you add to that? I mean, I guess I can just add that it was really wonderful to be part of a creative team or at least watch a creative team work like you, the three of you, where it was all about the talent and the individual and the uniqueness and the sort of what people are bringing and what's their power and not sort of what is their box that they need to be in. Um, and I think, you know, generally we've been very heartened, hopefully, as a people over the last few years, uh, not the least of which is thanks to a lot of the work that you've done, like on Glee and things like that. But I think what I love about this that I don't see super often that I'm hoping we'll see more often is the is the sort of passiveness of it and the fact that there are so many characters that are queer on the show and it's not the subject matter of the piece and it's not a source of oppression or trauma. It's just a part of the sort of realized tapestry of, of the world that we're in. And I think like this year, the one kind of difficult part about putting out original music for the first time, which is what I did earlier in the year, was like just by virtue of the fact that I was talking about dating men and, and, have, and being in relationships with men, it became sort of publicly this like coming out uh, thing and sort of got attached to that idea. And um, I just, I'm hoping that we're generally moving beyond the point where there's any kind of announcement necessary or it needs to be sort of commented on. And then when the show came out, having that, having the response to it be, part of what makes it beautiful is how assumed the kind of that all is, was like a very, very heartening, exciting thing. Yeah. Yeah, I think for me too, what's the most important thing for me is always just there, you have to make room for everybody. And I think with opportunity comes success. And that's part of, I mean, if you look at the ingredients on the stage, why I think people love the show, because there's something for everybody and that's the point, you know? It's, it, 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 it embraces everyone in the world. So this is a question for Ms. Lang. What has been the best decision you've made, regarding, you've made regarding your career and any advice for a female actor in their 30s? <laughs> wow. um, the best decision I've ever made in my career? Oh, I, I, that's impossible to answer. Um, let me go to the second part. Um, advice. The advice. Well, I, it's the same advice that the great S Kim Stanley gave me one time, you know, because you get really caught up in 
all the, the press and the publicity and the business and the this and the that and the, you know, acknowledgements and awards. And, and I remember her saying to me, because she played my mother in Francis, and she, and it, I mean, if you haven't seen enough of Kim Stanley, you should definitely watch The Goddess because it's probably the greatest film performance ever given. But she said to me at one point, she said, just remember, the work speaks for itself. And I've always remembered that because there are so many distractions in this business. And it's, you know, between what we have to do and the, you know, what's expected. Um, and like I said, you know, the awards, the press, the this and that. Really, the only thing that ever matters is the work itself. And if, if what you're doing feels true and means something to you, then all your, your only obligation, your only responsibility is just to put it out there and let it speak for itself. And I've always felt, you know, that those words, uh, they're what really matter. You know, it's the, it's the work itself. It's not all the trappings that come with it. And it, it has to be about the truth of the work and your intention and your investment. Um, so I think, you know, for a young actor starting out, to just remember that and not get caught up in all the other stuff that goes along with it. Because in the long run, at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is your truth. And all you can do is let the work speak for itself. Well said. Uh, this is a question for Ben. Ben, you said in the past you related to Evan Hansen in a way. Did you find yourself relating to Peyton in any way? Sure. I'm, I think I'm like a little bit uh, softer probably than Peyton, generally. Not that Peyton doesn't have any softness. Um, I think uh, he's very driven, uh, as Theo was talking about, uh, from, from a very young age, from when he was seven, he knew very instinctually, innately, what he wanted to do, and not necessarily in a way where he needed to give like a practical reason why or what he has in him that makes him want to do that. He just sort of really wanted to do that and felt that instinctually. And I also have felt that about being a performer and being an actor since I was about the same age, six or seven, and have been very much one-track minded and have, ex have sort of experienced what it means to sacrifice other parts of life as, as you do as well for the work you love and, the, and your passion and for that to stay on that one road and, and what you're willing to sort of let go of for that. Um, I would say that I like definitely uh, have a harder time compartmentalizing my emotions than he does. I think they are, if anything, get in the way a lot, and they, and I sort of lean into them as we all do and as we've been trained to do. Um, so that's probably where we diverge. But definitely, we're both very ambitious guys. I think that's true. But ambition now is a dirty word, you know, <laughs> right? I guess. I mean, well, I I think if anything, the show tries to sort of dispel that a little bit. I mean, I think. It's, it's a really positive thing. I think particularly, I mean, I, I, I'm not the person on this stage to speak on this, but I think particularly when women talk about ambition, it's seen in, in this really negative way, and that I think that that's hopefully something that this show and also just society in general is moving beyond as well. But I do think it gets a, it gets a bad rep. Yeah. Um, this is for the cast, which is, um, I, this is interesting for you guys to talk about and me is one of our final questions. They, um, this is from Raya. And the question was, um, how do you navigate so many different landscapes that exist within the show and with the characters? The show bends genre and tone so flawlessly. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> and I'm curious about how you master that as actors and as a creator. I think that I really got tripped up with that for a while. Um, when we were shooting last year and we were, I was reading all the scripts, I was like, what genre is this? And it, because it, I, just because it, it's doing so many things at the same time, and I kept being like, this is new. Like, I don't really see anything like this that's ever been done before, and so I just tried to focus and just make sure that I was in the moment and in the scene every single day, whatever I needed to do to just like not get in my head about that um, proved to be my path to success. And instead of being anxious about it, being excited that we got to do something that was you know, 
so many things at the same time. So that helped me. I think tr trust was a big thing for me. I think um, knowing, um, you know, Brad and Ian's and yours, your work, it, I, I think that for me it was just really trusting that you you had a very strong vision and if I was not um, in the same show as everyone else, you would let me know. <laughs> <laughs> so I just kind of kept trucking along and... <laughs> that's, that's good, I like that. Anybody else? Yeah, I mean, I think like, like R Ryan, Ian, and Brad's shows, they all live in a very specific world. And um, I think like the second I got the script, I read it and I was like, okay, like this is, this is of that universe. And so then taking that and then you show up to set and you're given these gorgeous costumes and you're like, ah, another piece of the puzzle. And then you show up at a mansion and there's a bear and you're like, ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, and then like what Theo said, you kind of have to just take it one step at a time. You have to like be in the moment, know what your character was doing there and just focus on that as opposed to the bigger world and the bigger picture because I didn't know what Lucy or Ronnie or David or they were all doing on other days of filming. So, you know, it's like, it's the different pieces of the puzzle and then you just, they put it together for us. <laughs> I just thought of something else that I was like, oh, let's maybe think of another thing. Um, I spent a lot of time last year while we were shooting uh, remembering what it was like when I was a kid and like how easy it was to just like, just like role play and like imagine. And I really tried to like capture that again and just like always be, I don't know, does that make sense? Just like, just like pure, like uninhibited, like joy and play. Yeah. yeah, my answer to that is interesting because when I first started off in the business, it was like in the mid nineties and I must've wrote four Sandra Bullock romantic comedy spec scripts. That was what was in vogue then, right? And I didn't go see those types of movies. That's not what I was interested in. And when I had my first piece of success, it was simply because I had said, okay, I'm just gonna write this for me. That was a thing called popular. That was very, very specific. And I had a lot of problems. Thank you, popular OGs. <laughs> I had a lot of problems with that show because, you know, we ran for two seasons and the network kept saying, it's too gay, it's too gay, take it out, it's too gay. And I'm like, I'm really gay, so. <laughs> but I was, and they, I would get notes like, this cheerleader cannot wear a fur coat. And I would say, why? I want her to. <laughs> and then finally I just, like, so I went through, I went through a, 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 a period of, of my work and then, Every time I, I started to then get some success, every time I started to write something that was, was about my interests in life, the, the clashing things that I'm interested in were the ones that always not only worked but were huge. And each time I was told that would never, they would, that would never work, you know? When I did Nip Tuck, I was told it would never, would never work. And when I was told, when I did Glee, never gonna work. And when Jessica and I did, um, American Horror Story that people don't remember how people really did not know what we were doing and actually were mad that we were doing it. Like it's sort of become more of a beloved cultural thing now but at the beginning it was very heretical because it put, it smashed ideas together. And my response to that is well that's what I love to do. When I was a kid, my two favorite people in the world were Dracula and Barbra Streisand. <laughs> so, in my work, you will see that together. And I'm like, good, I wanna watch that. I love Dracula and I love Barbara. And so I, I like, and also this show is so interesting to me because I think we're in a period now where, um, because there's so much content you know, existing, a lot of people want things that are just instantly, I know what this is, as you were saying earlier, like who's the hero? Who am I rooting for? Well, how do I get to, to the B stone? And I'm interested in, well, that should be a little harder for you to figure out. And the very fact that you love Peyton should, should make you, you know, think about yourself and who you are. And why can't, I mean, how insane is it that if I do a show 
that has Ben Platt, I don't have Ben Platt sing. Of course he's gonna sing. <laughs> that, I would be, I would kill myself. I would have my gay card taken away. <laughs> so, when I pitched this to Ben, he wasn't gonna sing, but three episodes in, I was like, Ben, please, will you sing? Simply because I love his voice. And, um, so, my answer to that, I don't see the world as a comedy or a drama or a musical. I see that as my day. And so I like to write things that reflect that. And also it's challenging. It's challenging for me to sometimes make this stuff work. Um, I think we have time for one more question. I'm getting a signal. Let me find one we haven't done. You're welcome. Um, let me find a cast one. Um, we did that one. We talked about Vienna. Um, I'll just do a quick one. It was a great cameo by Martina Navratilova. I love the tribute to the ending in Casablanca. What was the process like getting her for the role? Um, it was a very interesting story. So I was obsessed with Martina growing up. I, was, I loved tennis growing up and I loved her. And so when we wrote this pilot, I said to Brad, I think Gwyneth Paltrow should fall in love with our Martina Navratilova type. That would be really cool. And so we were like, okay. So we put out a casting donut for a, a Martina type. And it wasn't really working. And I said, well, screw this. Let's just go get Martina. <laughs> so our casting director, Alexa Fogel, Martina is hard to find, first of all. We found her, and she instantly said, that sounds fun. <laughs> and that's how we got her, simply because I think like a lot of people, she just wants to have fun. And she was so great. At the cast and crew loved her. She's so sweet and dynamic. And one of my favorite things is, is Martina in, in the episode. So that's how we got Martina. <laughs> Wes Anderson. Another person that I love, Wes Anderson. And... Um, I never really looked at it as a sort of a, a, a anything but a tribute to his, you know, Wes Anderson to me is a filmmaker of pointillism. It's like bizarre things, again, things that shouldn't be in a frame that work, that are interesting, that immediately, I think, clue you into character. So I've always kind of wanted to pay tribute to him. We did it a, we did it a little in the season with the clothes. And also just like in the scene that you were talking about, Julia, where you're sitting, at a dining table with a butler and a huge stuffed polar bear. You know, these things don't make sense. But I think when you as an actor saw that, you're like, okay, I know what this is. I knew what it was, I thought it was cool. Um, it was also some weird subtext about, you know, stuffed shirts and we don't have to get into that. But, but again, it's just things that I like putting together. Um, let me see if there's, we answered that. We answered the Joni Mitchell question. Last question um, for the cast. We kind of talked about this, but it's a great last question. So for all of you guys, was there any improv done by the actors in the scenes? We talked a little bit about Jessica and Zoe, but Ben, you can talk about this. I, I'll just add on the Jessica front that there was a scene where she makes bologna cups um, <laughs> for, <laughs> for me and Zoe Deutsch. Uh, and Zoe leaves the table to go, you know, powwow with her boyfriend, and I'm left alone with Jessica, and Brad allowed us to play a little bit, um, and he was like, S be, you know, be snooty, ask if there's gluten in it or something, and I was like, <laughs> okay, uh, okay, and so the, 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 the improv was like, um, excuse me, ma'am, I'm sorry for asking, but like, is, is there any gluten in the bologna cups, like, do you know, and she just kept saying over and over again in each take, and I don't know why I found it so funny, but I ruined all the takes to the point where it wasn't in the show because there was no usable version of it. But she just kept saying, like, well, let's see, uh, the inside is, uh, well, that's Velveeta. And, uh, <laughs> and the outside, that's bologna. Um, <laughs> I just couldn't get beyond it, and I ruined it. But I'm glad you know it now. <laughs> she was a woman who didn't know the word gluten, so. <laughs> yeah, you were like, I don't know what that is, but that's bologna and that's cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? I was like, I'm scared. I'm going to say what's on the page. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say it exactly how it is written. <clears throat> yeah. I found that the, the, the improv was just more of a way to relax a little into these characters. And whether or not it was used, it was more for us as, uh, for me at least, <clears throat> um, it was more for me to really just 
I don't know, get into the character in a different way, which is helpful. My two biggest fears are karaoke and improv. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to be very brave last year. Um, we are yeah, opposite no. people. What? We are exact opposites. I would say that those are my two favorite things. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this has been a great evening. I want to thank you guys. I also wanted to tell you that we start, uh, this is a fun little piece of news. We start filming The Politician, um, like I said, in the next week. And it's going to, it's, you're not going to have to wait a year for it. We're going to put it out next summer. So, um, which I think is going to be interesting to have this show with Bet and Judith talking about what we're shooting before the election. So it's going to be food for thought. So thank you all very much for coming.